I'm a voice hearer and I'm I'm proud to be a voice hearer. I used to be uh, labeled and negated and marginalized as a as a schizophrenic as the psychiatry has a tendency to to label people who who hear voices. So I'm chair of the uh, the Danish uh, Danish Hearing Voices Network and it's uh, also the first time when I uh, joined it started to um, work for the Hearing Voices Network and this that I began to see people who recovered which is something I never saw in psychiatry. I'm also uh, in the unique position that I've um, worked as a psychiatric nurse for many years before I became a user of the uh, same organization. But I never saw people recover there. Uh, you know, and that's, uh, I think, also one of the sad things that is uh, continuing to occur, uh, as we can see. You know, certainly um, uh, Robert Whittaker's uh, newest book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, clearly uh, shows that uh, in the Western world that psychiatry um, makes people chronically ill, shortens people's lives, and uh, this one. But in the hearing voices I began to see, that's where I see people. They recover, but they're recovering outside of psychiatry. I worked uh, as a psychiatric nurse and I believed that uh, uh, that there was a, you know, knowledge behind it in this one. That's perhaps been one of the biggest biggest shocks in my life to discover that the um, the science and the knowledge behind it is non-existent. The Hearing Voices movement uh, and the people who are recovering outside of psychiatry, of which the, let's face it, the people who are given the uh, uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, are usually the people who are, have traditionally been classified as the um, incurably ill, the most insane. Uh, we have uh, created um, uh, that voices are meaningful, that it is absolutely connected to people's life uh, stories. We have uh, uh, self-help groups, we work with people's voices, we, we, uh, we work for, for uh, giving people uh, meaning in their voices. But uh, if you're thinking about how people have uh, um, how people see the Hearing Voices movement in Denmark, um, certainly when we, we began it was uh, considered uh, 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 a, a weird thing and we still never get any funding for example so it's all uh, absolutely uh, totally grassroots by a very dedicated group of people um, but nevertheless we've had a, I believe a tremendous uh, impact in psychiatry because uh, by representing the, the, uh, the most uh, stigmatized group but we also represent psychiatry's um, absolute uh, most important clientele because schizophrenia is their, um, you know, raison d'être, almost in that sort of sense. Mm -hmm. This is the true illness. Mm -hmm. For the vast majority, there is uh, abuse that lies, uh, you know, is behind uh, behind it all. <coughs> of course, not with with uh, with everyone. But, uh, you know, and the classic ones are bullying, you know, you don't fit in in the school, the bullyings, and their sexual abuse is, is very common. Um, there is uh, uh, physical violence, there is, you know, neglect, psychological, and this one, and, and the typical one is you've been alone with it as a child. Denmark is a, a unique country in that we have social psychiatry and uh, uh, treatment psychiatry, and they're, they're actually been uh, separated. You don't really see that uh, in in other countries. So the psychiatry tends to be just you know one mm -hmm. um, group in in that. And uh, social psychiatry has actually welcomed the the hearing voices movement. So we have many many groups around there. There's a great deal of interest. Uh, this one, when we have our conferences, teaching, and this one, uh, there is always a very good representation from from social psychiatry, mm -hmm. and I'd say it's only just now that the treatment psychiatry is beginning to to sort of uh, uh, express an interest. Um, psychiatry, uh, psychiatrists have not uh, been uh, interested. Psychiatry's paradigm of the biogenetic model uh, uh, says that that uh, people with um, with uh, schizophrenia are genetically predisposed to, to develop uh, schizophrenia and uh, that when they do it's due to a uh, chemical imbalance in the brain. Being a psychiatric nurse uh, I used to believe that it was uh, you know a, a science that it was it was based on on um, a medical uh, foundation and that when people said that there was an illness that it was an illness but I came from a neurological ward 
And in the neurology ward, you would never dream of giving anybody a diagnosis unless you had, could see physically that there was a tumour of the brain. Or if you have epilepsy, you can, you can measure that. You know, all these things that you have a physical uh, proof of it. Now, psychiatry, I came into the psychiatric system and uh, I am stunned to see that it is purely based on a psychiatrist that either from his conversation with you can in unfortunately very often maybe even half an hour find out that you are schizophrenic and that has devastating consequences because in a conversation from that second onwards your life is changed absolutely and completely we have a whole system in uh, in in position to enforce treatment and the only thing is drugs and more drugs and more drugs so we're also a group of people who can expect to live here in Denmark on average 20 years shorter than than the average person on the street people who are given the diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, they all will be on drugs you do not find people who are off drugs I'm uh, actually also studying to be a psychologist, I'm finished very soon. Mm -hmm. The most recent uh, research done here in Denmark shows that only 8% of the people who are in psychiatry uh, get an offer of talking to a psychologist. So I was one of those who didn't have access to it. Uh, I was told that I would get much worse if I was to talk to, to uh, someone. I have tried many, many drugs uh, there. I uh, was uh, been absolutely uh, incapacitated with the drugs. I would, there would be absolutely no possibility of me uh, being able to work or study or have a so-called, as we say, a, a, a normal life if I had not um, uh, turned my back on psychiatry, found my own way, and and gotten off these uh, these drugs. For many of these people who who take uh, psychi uh, antipsychotics. Um, in the belief that it's correcting some chemical imbalance, which it is not. It is creating a chemical imbalance. But I have always, for example, loved loved to read. Mm. Um, but for the ten years that I was on uh, antipsychotic medication, all different kinds and mixtures, I couldn't read. I would read maybe one paragraph, and I wouldn't know what I'd read. Mm. The normal things like, you know, if you're going to... Uh, plan, let's say, plan making a cup of tea. There are various steps involved. I couldn't think of these steps. Mm -hmm. uh, my voices were continued. In fact, I'd say in many ways they got way they got way worse. Now we can discuss why they got worse because my life was uh, in an absolute shambles from a, having a uh, a job. Uh, you know, I was working as a psychiatric nurse. I had friends. I was studying at the university. I had a partner. When I went into the hospital ward and I was given this devastating diagnosis of schizophrenia and I spent the first uh, seven months in a closed inner section ward, um, in those uh, short period of time I lost everything. So not only was I given this uh, diagnosis of absolute hopelessness, but I lost my friends, I lost my job, I lost my studies, I lost Everything that was of value to me, but you become really absolutely flatliner. Anything like initiative to feel, oh, I feel like doing that, disappears. Um, sometimes, depending on the drugs, because I was tried many and various, but some of them were so, uh, so uh, powerful there that, uh, you know, people would ask me a question and I couldn't answer until a long time afterwards. Cognitively impaired. Um, mm and handicapped. You're absolutely mm -hmm. handicapped. I certainly had a good voice that I don't hear so often. I had one, I call him the Joker, mm -hmm. uh, and he was very helpful while I was in the psychiatric mm -hmm. because he, for some reason, I'm not good at jokes, but uh, my, my Joker voice uh, is actually very good at, at making things, you know, humour and, and, and jokes, you know, standing jokes and that. So I'd laugh a lot, and of course that's not very good in a, in a psychiatric hospital that I'm uh, laughing at uh, apparently nothing. But the voices did not uh, uh, disappear. I became more um, 
I didn't care. Nothing, nothing, nothing mattered. I would sleep hours. I mean, I had uh, 16 hours sometimes. I would sleep all day. And then the rest of the eight hours, I'd wake up to a, an empty, meaningless life and would wish I could sleep the other eight hours away as well. And this emotional blunting um, is... Uh, uh, has huge consequences. People do not think about the consequences. First of all, that you're handicapped. The inability to feel, uh, you know, when you're, somebody's talking about something sad, that you can empathize, mm -hmm. that you can become indignant, that you become excited. All these things are a natural part, in fact, fill way much more of a conversation than, uh, than uh, just the words themselves. The self-help groups that we try and work, of course, uh, one of the, the sad things I think is that many people come are um, sometimes very, very medicated. There's a few people who come to my groups who somehow come under the radar of psychiatry, usually because they actually have support from their family. And there's, of course, a, a big difference that if you're on medication and off uh, medication. I've had people in my groups who basically um, spend most of the time sleeping. I always welcome everybody because I think the very fact that they come and and uh, and want that there is uh, there is a hope in that one mm -hmm. and I think that's something I and and other people in the group can give. There was one period once where, where we where I closed the group for a period of time and that was because it was uh, a group of women only women and every single one of the women had been uh, sexually abused and there was a need for a, a period of time to to talk about about the issues there but otherwise it's been a, a mixed group um, I would say that uh, more in the last many years it's been actually more men for some reason certainly with my groups but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of men are coming to to the groups one of the things that people a new person starting very often they've never thought of giving their voices any names that's one of the first things uh, I encourage people to do, is who are these people? Sometimes they will come with a name themselves, the, the voices. Other times they won't, and then I encourage the person to give them a name that gives most uh, meaning to them. So if they're an abusive voice, maybe it can be an empowering way from the person themselves to start already the process of uh, changing the relationship with their mm -hmm. with their voices. Mm -hmm. For example, is it a uh, very critical voice? Who has been critical in your voice? Because it might be a woman's voice, but it might be a man who's uh, who's been the absolute critic in a teacher or something. There's uh, so many, many people. I, I don't know how many people I have met over the years, because I've been having these groups for quite a number of years now, uh, who come uh, and talk for the first time about the traumas in their life about being abused. That's something we never talk about in, you know, because I've also, I work in psychiatry, we never talk about how the life stories have, have uh, related. And these um, horrible incidents of incest, of rape, of violence. The main difference between people who hear voices and have problems with their voices versus the vast number of people who never have problems with their mm. voices, I think, you know, I mean, that's kind of, of course simplifying things, but but we're, but um, the major difference is that people who have problems and often end up in psychiatry is that they are afraid of their voices and they have a belief that their voices are somehow stronger than they are. There is no evidence for uh, people because you are distressed by life events mm -hmm. that have created voices are going to make you more violent. And uh, I think this is one of the myths that I absolutely want to you know, I, I don't know how I can get rid of it, but it's this assumption that schizophrenia and violence are joined at the hip. There is no evidence. There is evidence for that, uh, the vo certainly with the new, uh, since we imposed in about 2002 here in Denmark, a zero tolerance policy in psychiatry uh, has uh, shown a, a marked increase in violence. Many people, when they're being forced medicated and put in belts, struggle, fight. If you are not agreeing with the psychiatric paradigm mm -hmm. that you are ill and need treatment mm -hmm. uh, and uh, experience a group of people coming towards you to tie you to a bed, to inject stuff, and for many, many people who have been sexually abused, and uh, this one, this injection thing is a violation. It's like a re-trauma of uh, for example, uh, the the abuse. It is a, it is stuff being pushed into your body, that is highly highly stressful. Because if you look at it from that perspective, you're being attacked. 
You're being assaulted. It doesn't matter that somebody is saying, uh, can come and say, well, we're treating you, it's for your own good. Who is it? C.S. Lewis that talks about um, the people who are treating you for your own good are the most dangerous. And one of the things that the Hearing Voices Network works for is that we view uh, um, our movement as part of a demand for civil rights. And we are probably fighting the last civil rights battle, if, we li if you like, because psychiatry is that we have laws against us that, you know, that allow human rights abuses.